Hi, everybody. Uh, I work at FISI. I'm going to talk to you about uh, a little tool that we develop internally. Uh, and uh, it is really very simple. And uh, the main thing that I want to share with you is the approach that maybe you can also use it in, a, in your own development. Uh, so the, I'm going to first introduce uh, short, uh, short with FIDSI. Uh, then I'm going to talk about uh, how do we test uh, at FIDSI, how do we test our code. Then I'm going to talk about the tool that we developed. And then I'm going to talk a bit about the results that we achieved with it and next steps. So about FIDSI. Uh, our uh, FITAI was founded by uh, engineers uh, that uh, they were actually professors from the Unif University of Coimbra. And, uh, and uh, our mission today is to fight fraud um, and uh, using uh, machine learning. Uh, fraud in uh, e-commerce, fraud uh, in banks, and uh, that's mainly those frauds, but also fraud in general. And we have uh, more than 200 employees worldwide, worldwide. and uh, we are continuing to grow. And uh, uh, our company is very, uh, FITSA is very engineer focused, so most, uh, more of half the company uh, works in engineering and uh, in data science. Um, yeah, we have offices in Portugal, in Lisbon, in Porto and Coimbra, and also in the United States uh, and London. Um, yeah, we work with some of the largest banks globally, uh, one in five of the top 25 banks, and also some big sports brands that I, can, I cannot tell you exactly what uh, the name of the coins, but uh, they are big coins. And um, myself, I work at FISAI since 2012, so uh, some years ago. And uh, I work in front end uh, in the main product that we developed, that is the fraud prevention product, and uh, that allows us to train and deploy machine uh, learning models to prevent fraud. And uh, basically, we have a front end with, when, where we can uh, train the models, uh, do the machine learning, uh, all the, the process of machine learning, training data, um, seeing the results, all that. Um, yeah, and the, it is uh, originally a single. It is a single page application that we originally back in 2012 implemented using Backbone JS, and we uh, of the, over the last uh, year or two, we are trying. We are, we are migrating to React, uh, but it, it is a very large application with uh, dozens of models, and uh, so it is. A, it has been a process, but uh, it is a complex application. So. Um, how do we test this complex application that we that we developed and we have? Uh, we have uh, several layers of tests. This is basically very standard. Uh, we have the unit tests uh, of total. We have uh, front end, back end, so forth. We have uh, seventeen thousand unit tests. We have uh, system tests that are integration tests, but just of the back end. And we have Selenium tests, that, the, what, that it is what I'm going to talk about uh, today. Um, or it is related to Selenium tests. And we have uh, one, uh, 1,000 Selenium tests that test the, the application end-to-end. Uh, -end. And also we do some manual exploratory, exp exploring, exploratory tests. So Selenium, I don't know if uh, everybody uh, knows Selenium, what Selenium is. Okay, Selenium is a tool that, basic, that allows us to automate browsers, to automate, uh, simulate user behavior. So click here, uh, type in the input, and uh, we can use that to basically test our application and uh, try to log in, uh, see if the login was successful and uh, make several types of assertions. And uh, the main, uh, the main uh, thing about Selenium is that uh, it tests the application end-to-end. -end. Uh, I mean, you could use it to test just uh, static components, but we use it to test the application end-to-end, -end, so it, it, they work as a validation test. Um, so, but this, this is as a problem. The, there's a problem with this, is that because we are testing uh, the, the application end-to-end, -end, 
uh, it is hard to to make the tests run predictably. So we have a lot of components. We have the browser. We have the network. We have the the backend itself. That uh, even though it should not, it carries on a bit of state between tests. So it is hard to have the tests run the term, uh, in a deterministic way. And uh, this causes uh, us to have uh, some problems because because tests are not deterministic, sometimes they fail uh, just because uh, um, some scenario that we are not expecting occurred because the network was slower or because the machine was slower or because uh, something changed that uh, in the backend that uh, changed the the timings or maybe there's some state in the backend that causes some operations to take longer or take less and this is because <coughs> um, because uh, uh, because tests are not deterministic they may pass locally when we implement it, them but uh, they may not uh, they may fail sometimes in the CI builds and they may fail in ways that are not easy re reproducible and uh, we have the uh, and the seal. This is dates of 2014 because it's just an illustrative image. But we have uh, a lot of problems um, because our fails were uh, our builds were failing with uh, failed tests, and we had no confidence in the builds. We didn't know when the build failed, if it was due to an actual regression or um, due to a flaky test. That that's that's what we call this test that keep failing sometimes. Maybe some tests only fail like one, one, uh, one in uh, an under times. So this is, this is very hard to debug because the test fails a very... Uh, it takes a lot of time to fail. Uh, but because we have a lot of tests, uh, it ends up that, that in each build uh, several tests were failing and uh, we didn't have confidence in the builds. When we implement, implemented a new feature, we un wanted to run the builds and uh, some tests failed. We didn't know if it was because all of our changes, if it was because the tests were not running uh, consistently um, and uh, we didn't have confidence in the builds. So we, at the start of this year, we, start, we decided to to address this problem, and uh, uh, and we had an initiative that we called uh, the hardening, that uh, where we try to reduce the number of uh, the number of uh, oh I had some images but I forgot uh, where we try to reduce the number of uh, flaky tests and improve the reliability of the CI builds. Um, so, and one of the things that we looked at was exactly this: How do we make the, our swanning tests more deterministic? How do we reduce the variability that occurs in the tests that uh, makes them fail? So, in the CI builds, so uh, the QA team and the front end team we talked and uh, thought about this problem, uh, and uh, we realized the, that uh, one of the things that was hurting the swanning test the most was that uh, sometimes the Solana tests were not waiting for uh, the front end to finish some uh, synchronous operations. And uh, locally, because the machine was fast, the test were, is, were passed. Because imagine you make a request, but it's a local request, so it is very fast. But uh, in the CI builds, it took longer, and then it failed sometimes in the CI builds when the machines were under stress. Uh, so we tried to come up with a, a solution to this problem, uh, ah, and also, yeah, and these are lots of problems because uh, uh, even uh, sometimes we needed to 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 change something in the front end that caused something that was uh, happened in a synchronous way. So there was no need to wait, but, but maybe we, we would change it to synchronous because of some new requirement, and then the test would start to fail, and then they would not fail immediately because they would only fail when the machines in CI were slow, and this is a pain to understand what causes a test to start failing. So this is a big maintenance issue. Um, 
Yeah, so we needed the Selenium to reliably wait for the front end uh, asynchronous operations, the requests, and uh, maybe delays, maybe other types of operations that take some time, and maybe the Selenium is not aware of them. Uh, and uh, previously we were relying in the thing if you are spinners in the screen uh, or uh, in the jQuery active property, but that is not a very reliable way because maybe the spinner changes of changes the, the way with the, that we show the spinner. Maybe the the there are some other synchronous operations that we are not taking into account. Uh, for example, now we are going to have uh, no, no, not now, but in the future we may have a synchronous rendering also in React. So uh, how do we deal with that? Um, so when we arrive at this uh, problem, st problem statement, that we need Selenium tests to be able to re reliably wait for the asynchronous operation operations in the application. So we can know that when we are making an assertion in Selenium, we know that the state is always the same, and we can have confidence in that, and uh, we and then we can have tests that are more stable and do not fail uh, because of some external factor. So we came up with uh, what we call the async operations tracker, uh, which is uh, basically an API to to give uh, visibility, external visibility, outside of the, the front-end application of the synchronous operations that are uh, happening inside the, the application. And this allows Selenium to wait on, the, on those operations and uh, to run in a reliable way. Uh, and the, the API is actually very simple and even the implementation is very simple. Uh, we have uh, an operation count method that allows us to, in Selenium, to know how many operations are going and allows us to wait until the operations uh, reach zero. That basically is the only state that we want to interact with the application. We also have uh, four debug purpose, purposes. Uh, a method that allows to see which operations are ongoing. Uh, if we want to Maybe if we have a timeout of an, an operation that ne never reaches, that never ends, so the, the operations count is, is always like one or two, we want to know which operations are pending and to maybe understand why it is happening, if, if it's the operation that is taking really long time or maybe there's a bug and the, we are not marking the operation as finished. And, to, in the, and this is a global counter, so uh, this, this counts all the operations in the in the application. So, but how do we internally keep track of those operations? We basically have uh, three methods. Uh, one method, method that is operation started that allows us just to say, okay, I'm starting this operation. I have this ID that allows us to track what operation it is. When we, and we can start several operations with the same ID, for example several AJAX requests. Uh, we can mark the operation as ended, and uh, this will decrease, uh, for example, if I started three AJAX requests, and I mark one as ended, so I now have two uh, pending AJAX requests. And uh, we can mark all the operations as ended. And this is useful, for example, when we are doing a debounce, and we may have uh, several operations that started uh, due to the debounce, and uh, we want to end them all in a, in a, just uh, in a one just once. We want to end them all because the debounce actually doesn't call the callback for each uh, call that is made to the debounce. Um, so this is just the gist of it. We have some sugar methods that allows us to better deal with promises. For example, we automatically wrap a promise um, and uh, we call the, the operation started and the operation ended automatically. And uh, we can also wrap a method that returns a promise. And uh, this is one of the things that we try to do. We try to use this uh, you, to integrate this in the application in a way that didn't require the developers to 
always type these. So we have this integrated in our abstraction to fetch data from the backend. We have this integrated in our uh, higher order component in React for uh, fetching uh, async dependencies. Um, and uh, and uh, we have uh, this also integrated in the debounce functions and so on, so that uh, we don't need to type this uh, when we are usually programming. This is just uh, this is used uh, um, basically in the, our internal APIs and in our internal component internal components, um, so that these operations are automatically tracked. Obviously, there are always some uh, special operations that need to be tracked. Specifically, but the idea is that for them to be the um, the, the, the exception. Okay, so I have a, uh, an example here that is really simple. I'm uh, I'm running a plot uh, after some results arrive. So uh, I just marked the operation I started here. This is really very simple, and uh, I mark it. As handed when I'm, I'm, uh, uh, I finished the rendering and so so I can um, safely uh, can safely assume that the plot is rendered and it, that it will, that it will not catch the plot uh, in a half rendered state or something like that and uh, and be consistent. So and uh, also here we can have use the sugar method to avoid having to uh, increase and decrease the operations by hand. And the implementation, as I said, is really very simple. This is just a map. And the main thing that I wanted to share with you was the approach and how we solve the, this problem. And this, we just have a map that we uh, where we store uh, as a key the operation ID. And then we um, we increase the, the number of uh, of operations. Uh, yeah. So now to some results. Um, we have uh, at uh, red here the period where, where we were doing the, that phase that we call the hardening, where we were really focused on the improving the build stability and so on. Uh, and then in the we this this chart shows the number of tests failed, and the, these blue bars are the builds that failed. So we have a lot more of tests failing here in the builds, and these some of them are regressions. But uh, um, it's not that we introduced uh, in this period introduced uh, more regressions in the code, and we uh, here introduced less regressions. Uh, is that uh, here we had a lot of flaky tests? And uh, we have the un unusually uh, high number of uh, failed tests in the builds, and we here we got that under control, and we still have some uh, failing tests due to the regressions and even some flaky tests that we are weren't able to fix yet, um, because even so, not not all the flaky tests are related to front end. Some are related to back end bugs and so on, and maybe some are related to front end. Uh, but there are, there are very few of those, I believe. Um, yeah, so we were able to increase the reliability of uh, our Selenium tests, increase the confidence that developers have in the builds, and uh, the main thing for me here was the communication between the QA and the front-end team, because we reached a very simple solution, and that uh, worked very well and uh, allow us, allowed us to improve our, basically, our development workflow and uh, our quality of, of life in development. Um, some pitfalls, um, not all asynchronous or asynchronous calls should be tracked. For example, uh, if we have a timeout to hide a toast or something like that, we may not want to 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 track that using this tool because uh, uh, it's not like it's, some, it, it's not like it is an operation in progress. It's just a call that is asynchronous. Um, also, as I said, not all operations are tracked automatically because we have some custom code that maybe does a 
uh, a request in, a, in a unusual way and uh, needs to be tracked automatically. And uh, obviously, Solana needs to check the tracker before each assertion, and uh, that's very important. And uh, we need to be very careful not to forget to see all the code paths, to never forget to mark an operation as handed, because otherwise we may have a code path where the operation does not end, and we then the Solana tests will get blocked. Uh, in terms of next steps, uh, we are still tracking down uh, uh, the remaining uh, uh, synchronous operations that we need to track using Tracker. Right now, uh, I don't think there's a lot of them, but uh, we are, this is an ongoing process. Uh, we need to keep investing time in fixing fake tests and improving our developer experience. And uh, we need to keep the communication between the front end and the QA team so that these kinds of problems uh, can be easily fixed and uh, with the help of both teams. And uh, that's it. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so I was uh, just asking if do you guys use Selenium directly or do you use uh, any kind of uh, framework that wraps it? No, we use a uh, directly. No, but actually, the, it's the, the QA team that uh, writes the Selenium test. Um, Way of using something like DevTools, the browser DevTools, to track the ongoing requests? Yeah, no. Because Selenium does, ha does not have integration with uh, the DevTools, so it would be. The browser could expose it somehow? No, I don't think. We didn't, we, we didn't uh, research into that, but uh, uh, Selenium has a thing also that is very annoying. That is, is that if you open the, I don't know why it is. We never actually investigated that. But uh, if you open the um, developer tools when it's when it is running, it's it, gone. it dies. Yeah. So what we do to debug is to put the sleep in Selenium and then we can open the console. But I don't know why it does that. Uh, but uh, yeah, but this is. I think this was really the simplest thing that we could came up, and that's uh, that. Uh, where we went. Also because there are other uh, operations aside the, the requests. Um, maybe, for, for example, the debounce uh, is a place that where we want, where we, where we have a timeout that we want to wait for. Uh, and uh, there are other examples. For example, if you have some kind of asynchronous rendering that is not tied up to directly to a Ajax request. Um, or maybe uh, even if we are using promises and uh, we are uh, have a thing, have, we have an asynchronous call, uh, we may have a, a small period there where the we are still waiting from the promise because it is asynchronous. So we don't know if it takes like two two milliseconds. Then, um, so yeah, I think this is a more reliable way that than just watching. The requests because there there are some tools that uh, that why that are similar to Selenium that do that they wait for the requests to finish. So just out of curiosity, uh, how did you did the assert? Did you override it in some way? Oh, the, sorry, to, to make sure that all the asserts wait for the ah okay the. The, in the our internal, we have like an internal library that uh, the QA folks use for uh, um, for um, basically for using Selenium. They have uh, abstractions and uh, and uh, they are heavy have in place some checks that they, they run before each assertion. So I'm not sure how exactly they do it. I think they use the. I think they. I don't know. I. I will not. I don't. I don't. Do, I don't know exactly specifically if they, if they extend the assertion class or because I don't even know a lot of Java. Uh, or if they have like a custom method 
and that and they use that. But I know that they are they have already in place the infra infrastructure to run code before each assertion, and we just plug in into that. And uh, yeah, so also that was another reason because uh, that for infrastructure was already in place, so we needed just to do this. You know, you do some pulling to, to check the, the tracker because it doesn't trigger any event. Yeah, 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 yeah. It, uh, it, uh, it. Uh, I don't know exactly what uh, is the interval, but uh, it pulls. Uh, it is. It pulls uh, the this. It makes this this uh, JavaScript call mm -hmm. in a pulling cycle. Okay. And uh, if it uh, it uh, if it is not uh, after a long timeout, like. Uh, Five minutes. If it is not finished, it it aborts and it prints all the operations that were uh, in progress. Uh, yeah, it would be nicer if you had some kind of events, maybe, but mm -hmm. it is hard to do that. Integrate it's the so runtime yeah. JavaScript runtime with uh, Selenium. Yeah. You know the percentage of tests that are flaky after you changed it? No, that oh, that uh, yeah. Uh, I wanted to have like better statistics, but we the problem was that before we did uh, this phase of uh, hardening and improving, we didn't have uh, metrics, and uh, even now the metrics are very sketchy because it is hard to know if a test is really failing, it is flaky or not, and uh, yeah, I, I wasn't uh, I tried to I tried to ask the QA team for that, but they didn't have like the reliable metrics other than the, this chart. Because it, even in those uh, in those in the, that chart, we, you don't know what are actual regressions or flaky tests because the test just failed and you don't know it. That is why it is so frustrating. The question regarding React: How do you detect when the render uh, is executed if, yeah, uh, if so the state is changed in the application? I don't know if you use uh, Redux or something like that. No, no. We actually we just use uh, just React, and uh, and we also we always uh, we all, the the way that we use it, we have some um, asynchronous components that fetch dependencies, mm -hmm. and we we have uh, and the, that 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 are higher order components, and we have the tracker integrated into that. But uh, other than that, our the way that we use React, it always renders um, synchronously or very fast, so it is not uh, not a problem. Mm -hmm. But maybe when we switch to uh, and when React switch to a synchronous rendering, and uh, when we upgrade to to it, maybe we will need to integrate it with React, and to so that we can make sure that no nodes are uh, still left to render. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you.